Hey guys, welcome to your study of uh, World War I. Uh, this seems like a logical, natural progression to our study, uh, following our study of industrialism and populism and imperialism and so on, the progressive era. Um, World War I uh, is an inevitable conflict the United States gets involved in. I will be talking, comparing a little bit uh, of the progressive era, specifically the suffrage movement, to World War I, uh, recalling some of those events uh, in that time period. And as always, uh, feel free to pause this if you feel like you're, everything's moving too fast or if you need to write things down. Go ahead and pause it or uh, play back whatever you need to do. Several objectives uh, to be covered in this section. Uh, mainly, we'll, we'll look at the causes and the major players and then the results. So let's start with the results. We'll go back to more results later on, but let's look at this one major result. Uh, well, United States becomes a, uh, or continues to be, a global power. Following the Spanish-American War, we have new territories that we did not expect to get, uh, but through the Treaty of Paris of uh, 1899, we did end up getting a lot of territories worldwide. So now we feel like we have to be involved in world affairs. That's a major issue for anti-imperialists and socialists alike. Um, but regardless, we have these world markets now. We have these world possessions now, worldwide possessions now. So you know, we, we have to, to stay involved to, to protect those. Uh, another major result is the fact that uh, even though this was called the war to end all wars, World War One simply planted the seeds for the beginning of World War Two. Now, there are four long-term causes of the war. Uh, the assassination of the Archduke is essentially the straw, the final straw, the straw that breaks the camel's back, if you will. Um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand is traveling, touring through Bosnia-Herzegovina. And um, just outside of Bosnia is the is the Austrian army practicing military maneuvers, as they say they are um, it, most likely they are there for uh, a, a bullying type situation. Look at the size and strength of our military. See, Austria Hungary wanted to annex uh, Bosnia and, and parts of Serbia, and the Serbian government wouldn't have nothing to do with it. Well, within the Serbian. Uh, group within in Bosnia and Herzegovina was a rebel group. Um, basically, they will stand up as the last line of defense against Austria-Hungary, known as the Black Hand, and they do assassinate Archduke. They throw a bomb under his car. Uh, the car is uh, damaged, but it's enough to get him to the hospital. Later on, he's uh, shot. Both he and his wife, Sophia, are uh, shot and killed by members of the Black Hand. And so we see the uh, the declaration of war there, which we'll get to in just a second. But long-term cause of the war, uh, uh, one is militarism. Uh, the idea that if you look across your borders and you see your neighboring country building up your uh, their weapons and, and increasing the size of their military, you have to kind of wonder uh, what's going on. So when country A starts to build their military, country B reacts and builds up their military. Well, of course, country C is going to not want to get trampled and left behind, so they build up there. So it's just an ever-growing growing arms race uh, between these countries here in the, the middle portions of Europe and, and Russia, part of Asia. Another cause is the secret alliance system. Uh, this is nothing new. Countries have alliances with one another. Why it's called secret, I don't know. It just wasn't made worldwide. Uh, this has been going on since probably 1903, 1904 where these countries are making secret alliances with one another. Throughout the war, we have the Allies, or the Triple Entente, uh, made up of Britain, France, and Russia, and the United States does join this side. That's why they're called the Allies, because the United States is part of them. Uh, that's that's how we reference our involvement in the war. Uh, but we don't get involved until 1917. The, uh, the other portion of the uh, war was fought by the Triple Alliance, or the uh, Central Powers, as they are called, Germany, Austria-Hungary, in Italy, the Ottoman Empire of the, those countries. Another cause, colonialism. When the United States got involved in the imperial race, it was not to seek out new territories. We did not want colonies worldwide. Uh, the government made that very clear. We were simply looking for new markets to sell the surplus of goods to or to trade our surplus of goods with. Uh, as it happened, we did end up getting territories worldwide, but again, we weren't trying to colonize. Uh, we did take on Puerto Rico and Guam as uh, annexed to the United States. We helped Cuba set up the government. We did hold on to the Philippines longer than expected, but again, trying to set up, a, set up their own democratic-style government or trying to help them run a democratic-style government. 
but never like uh, Europe did we want colonies worldwide. And then, of course, nationalism is a cause of war, the idea that your country, your race, your culture is better than everybody else. And so we see this very specifically in the uh, the Austria-Hungarian conflict with Serbia. Austria-Hungary wanted a piece of Serbia, and Serbia wasn't going to have anything to do with it. July 18, 1914, shortly after the Archduke is assassinated, we see the uh, the declaration of war. And letter A makes sense. Austria-Hungary just had their Archduke assassinated by not necessarily Serbia, but by a group that finds residence within Serbia. And so uh, Serbia is, is being uh, declared against because they allow these people to exist in their land. The secret alliance between Russia and Serbia takes effect and Russia declares on Austria-Hungary. Now Russia claims they're trying to be the big brother. Let's take care of the little people who can't defend themselves. But uh, probably in reality, Russia wanted wanted Austria-Hungary -Hung to uh, be a part of their territory. tour. I think they wanted to claim Austria-Hungary as part of Russia. Germany, having a secret alliance with Austria-Hungary, declares war on Russia. Now the next part, declaring war on France, kind of makes you laugh because, you know, the war is taking place right there in Central Europe. And then all of a sudden, Germany declares war on France, too, on the all clear on the other western side of Europe. It had absolutely nothing to do, geographically speaking. France, however, was important. They did have an alliance with Russia, which meant they had an alliance with Serbia. Germany knew that if they declared war on Russia, they'd eventually have to declare on France. So they just cut to the chase and declared war on France. But it is, is kind of funny that they would declare on a country so far away. The leaders... Um, the big three of the of the war, we have Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, King George V of England, and Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany. Yes, they all look alike. It's because they're all cousins. How will that be for a uh, Thanksgiving dinner? Interesting. Moving on. This was the first modern war in regards to technology. Uh, we... The human race were very good at creating new and wonderful things to destroy each other with. Examples are the machine gun. One machine gun can replace 80 men on the line. Tanks, first tank in England. The United States played with a tank. France had tanks. Germany had tanks. Oh, back to the machine gun. Um, American inventor, Maxim, I believe proposed uh, or, or you know showed his invention to the US Army and at the time we were neutral we saw no need for it and so we turned him away well he goes to Germany and Germany preparing for war in this idea of militarism this arms race gladly accepts his plan and, and builds numerous machine guns countless machine guns uh, moving on, aircraft, the French were very good, uh, as well as Germany. The the air wars mainly fought between France and, and Germany. England gets involved. A lot of American soldiers go and volunteer as part of the uh, the Lafayette Escadrille. I just said that completely incorrect, but we fought with the French in the air. The American volunteers did. And, of course, chemical warfare. And after this war, chemical warfare is outlawed. Uh, in the rules of war, but we, again, mustard gas, and not just tear gas, yes, but mustard gas, phosphoric uh, acid, just fantastic ways of hurting each other and wiping out the enemy. Trench warfare uh, gets its claim to fame in this war, although this is not really a technology, it's a new strategy that's being used. Just miles and miles and miles of trenches across Europe uh, that some are still there today as part of a memorial uh, historical part. They're, they're left there. You can go see 600 miles of trenches from the North Sea to Switzerland, which was which was what was called the Western Front. Good movie, All Quiet on the Western Front, by the way, in, uh, as far as World War One is concerned. Again, with the trench warfare being a strategy, uh, this this strategy <laughs> really did nothing more than create a war of stalemate uh, in one battle, the Battle of the Somme. Um, 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, just thousands of men uh, died for just a matter of a few yards or a few feet of territory. Um, trench warfare was was carried out in such a way that neither side could really gain advantage, and then the the area between the trenches became so decimated that it's considered no man's land. If you get stuck out there, no man is returning uh, from that. Early, early, early trenches. This is probably more of a transportation trench where you're moving to either the front lines or the rear lines. This is not really a trench for fighting. There's just no there's no step to step up on to run out of for anything. This is probably just a transportation trench. Here's more of a trench in which you were uh, stationed and to hold your ground, so to speak. You can step up on the ledge. You still have cover, and you can see out over and uh, shoot at your enemy. Um, World War One Museum in Kansas City is a fantastic uh, visit. If you go, they have a uh, a lot of re recreation, uh, recreated scenes and 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 things to do up in that. Uh, museum. It's you can spend the entire day there. It's it's absolutely phenomenal to go visit. Um, fairly, I'd say fairly clean trench, so to speak. Maybe it's because the picture looks fairly clean, but the down here the actual walking portion of the trench is is fairly clean. You can see that some of the sides have fallen down. They had to use uh, patchwork of sticks and branches. These guys are not dead. These guys are sleeping, taking. Uh, step anytime they can, sleep anytime they can. It is in World War One that the terms shell shocked uh, originates. This is the the physical symptoms of shell shock are not new to World War One. I. I mean, the it, it's anytime you're in war, all the way back to early days in the United States history, all the way back to Revolutionary War history. There's there's been soldiers who suffer from this condition, but it gets its name uh, shell shock during World War One because of all the constant bombardment of the men in the trenches and the and the area around the trenches. That uh, you know these men went off to war thinking it was going to be this great and wonderful thing. They they come home heroes. Uh, they came home changed men. Today we know it as PTSD. So why did the United States get involved other than uh, to protect our economic interests worldwide? Uh, why is the United States involved? Well, f from the start of the war until 1917, very few, very little help from America. We did contribute uh, financially, and then there were some American volunteers in the uh, Air Corps with France. But the United States gets involved because of some things that happened specifically to the United States. And there's also uh, not only the things you see on the screen, but also uh, we were concerned, the bankers, and I say we, I mean the bankers of the United States, were concerned that maybe... If the if the uh, triple entente loses, then that means we don't get our money back. The money that we loaned the Allies doesn't get paid. So, you know, there's a possible reason, again, socialist idea, that maybe we get involved to secure the victory to make sure we do get our loans paid back. Regardless of that, <coughs> three things, three legitimate things happen that do cause us to get into war. Germany had been bombing cargo ships, passenger cruise liners that they believed were carrying weapons of war. President Wilson sends a request to Germany to stop bombing passenger ships. Um, and for a short time, they do listen and agree to that. Uh, but then we have the sinking of the Lusitania. 128 Americans are killed. Uh, then the sinking of the Sussex, the French vessel, the Sussex, and there's some Americans injured on that. And then finally, uh, England intercepts a telegram and passes that information on to the United States that informs us that Germany is secretly forming an alliance with Mexico. In the event that the United States go does get involved in the war, Germany hoped that Mexico would stage an attack on our southern border, forcing the United States to fight a war on two sides. Well, the telegram uh, is intercepted, as I said, by the British. It's held on to it for a while because the British weren't sure that the United States was, was actually going to get involved, and so this is kind of like the little push that the United States needed. England held on to it just long enough, and then when things got bad, that, this was the final 
thing. They pushed it our way, and, and that was enough, you know, for Germany to be doing this secretly um, was enough, and Wilson asked Congress to declare war. That event, that's called, the telegram was known as a Zimmerman, Zimmerman telegram. So when we do finally get in, involved in the war, Wilson's uh, request to Congress was to uh, make the world safe for democracy. And here's where I want to bring back the progressive uh, era, specifically the suffragists. The uh, the suffragists, and especially the National Women's Party, take this and run with it. And they make huge banners um using Wilson's words specifically and they had to be careful because they were not only they were already picketing the White House which was causing a lot of issues they were being arrested for crazy charges like obstructing traffic which they were on the sidewalk but it, it's a trumped up charge but that's the situation that's the times uh that they were in uh the sedition act uh, made it illegal for anyone to criticize the government to criticize the war to criticize the president so by picketing they are in, in not necessarily criticizing anything, so they had to come up with this trumped-up charge of obstructing tr traffic. Well, then they continue picketing, but then they also have these banners that quote President Wilson specifically. And this one quote, you know, to make the world safe for democracy was the was the big one. You know, President Wilson, how can you claim to uh, say we're fighting a war for democracy when we don't even have a true democracy or full democracy at home? And then they incorporate the Bible, you know, you you, you remove the speck from your own eye before you try to pick out the plank from your neighbor's eye or vice versa to remove the plank from your own eye before you try to take out the speck of your neighbor's in your neighbor's eye and uh that that caused a lot of serious issue for the national women's party they're rounded up thrown in jail and then they uh they voluntarily go on hunger strikes but um it, it they had they they were right they they nailed wilson to the wall uh very 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 well uh made it very tough for him at home um wilson wants uh he starts working on a peace plan long before the war is even over part of his peace plan the 14 points plan was to have self-determination for all countries involved it's essentially give every country the right to govern themselves again hypocritical what are we doing in the philippines well we're helping them set up their own government the philippines don't want our help and then Wilson also uh, establishes plans or draws up plans for a permanent League of Nations. And of all the 14 points, point number 14 is the creation of a League of Nations. And that's the only one that European leaders accept in this Treaty of Versailles. Another reason Wilson declares this uh, a war to save democracy is because Tsar Nicholas II um, abdicates. He steps down. I think it's actually supposed to be the first. Tsar Nicholas I abdicates. Uh, the Bolshevik Revolution has taken place in 1917, and that is when Trotsky and uh, Lenin come in full force with the Bolsheviks and force out the Mensheviks. The Bolsheviks are the working class party. The Mensheviks are the aristocratic party in Russia. Um, bloody revolution in the streets. Trotsky, Lenin and Trotsky claim power and uh, throw out the old monarchy and establish socialism and eventually communism and it's the first time that the people of the world realize that communism is no longer a theory it's actually in full-fledged uh, movement now um, anyhow when the dictatorial monarchy of Tsar Nicholas the sec the first is gone America can say that this is a fight for democracy because Russia essentially pulls itself out of the war and so now it's England and France and the United States fighting against this evil power of Germany. Two million men are called up, drafted into the war. The Selective Service Act is passed. Two million men are drafted into the war to give help to the Allies to fight against Germany. Notice that it's not fighting against Austria-Hungary. By this time, in 1917, Austria-Hungary has essentially stopped fighting the same thing can be said for Serbia. Serbia is no longer fighting. All of the allies, the alliances in this whole madness are fighting. And Austria and Serbia are just kind of stepping back and watching it all happen happen around them. On the home front, we see the first major takeover of the government in 
regards to the economy and social life of the people. Um, during the progressive era, we see a move from laissez-faire government to some regulatory government, but now this is a major overhauling of the economy by the government. The United States gets involved. We need money for the war. Um, our, I think our total budget had never surpassed $30 million or $30 billion. Uh, just the war uh, demands itself was $35 billion. Uh, so the government sets out on a campaign to raise money two ways. They raise money through Liberty Bonds, asking for private donations from citizens with the promise to pay back with interest, and then also to raise taxes. Uh, taxes on profits, for the, the excess c profits of corporations, uh, also a graduated income tax. Sound, sound familiar? Isn't that a populist idea? And then inheritance taxes. All of this helped raise money for the war. Um, government takes over the economy in regards to the industries. They create an, a council of national defense. And that council determines that for efficiency, wartime production should be held in certain sectors of the United States. One sector would be in charge of transportation, another in charge of fuel, another in charge of uh, getting the food for the war. The War Industries Board controls rationing of military supplies. Again, this is privately controlled, uh, but it is a government-run, privately controlled. Government established it, put it in the hands of private control. Uh, again, rationing of supplies uh, for the war. Uh, government's involved in the labor uh, of industries as well, the National War Labor Board establishes itself it ends it ends all labor disputes it forces the owners to give the workers eight hour work days minimum later living standards equal pay for women that are doing equal work and makes the owners agree to the rights of the unions giving them the right to organize and bargain collectively on the workers side of things it says if you strike it will be seen as an act of uh, uh, being a traitor uh, an act of espionage, an act of sedition if you go on strike during war. So we see industry running very efficiently. Uh, workers and owners don't necessarily see eye to eye, but they agree to disagree and get along during the war. Uh, in regards to women in, in the workplace, women do uh, take many of the jobs that are held by men. The men go off to war, and so there's vacancy, and so women do uh, get involved in there uh, when men come back from the war uh, a lot of women return to their home um, or they're fired either way but the jobs are given back to the men when they return some women do get involved in the army as uh, drivers for the military driving driving uh, the higher ups around as far as African Americans and their involvement in the war we see the great migration this was mentioned before in our study of the South and the West. Uh, the Great Migration was a move out of the South to northern cities to take advantage of the jobs in uh, in the big cities, um, especially during this time of war. But it was also uh, a way for them to escape racism and prejudice uh, of the South and the Jim Crow laws. Uh, on a side note, the United States comes up, comes up with an idea. See, one of the reasons we got in the war was because of the German submarine warfare on passenger ships so the United States comes up with an idea called the convoy system essentially you have uh, your cruise ships and your cargo ships escorted by military ships and because of this not one American was killed once the convoy ship or the convoy system uh, began Another aspect, another way the United States gets involved in the war is through the propaganda campaign. Probably the most famous poster of the war, still famous today, is Uncle Sam and I Want You for the Army. Encouraging men to enlist, but also uh, putting them on a guilt trip. Um, we need you. Selective Service Act is passed. We get 3 million men in the draft. We get 2 million men for volunteers just to go fight the dirty, nasty scoundrels, the Huns. Here's some propaganda posters. If I were a man, I would join the Navy, help crush the menace of the seas. Again, unrestricted uh, German submarine warfare, um, using, the, using the lives killed on the Lusitania as a way to garner support for the war. The Committee on Public Information was directed by a journalist, again, a government-run in industry, but turned over to privately run uh, groups or private groups to run it. They 
hired 75,000 men to travel the United States to give speeches. These speeches would be given in theaters uh, just before a movie would begin, and the speeches would take four minutes to deliver. And they were updates on how the war was going and how people could help here at home. These men were called four-minute men because you know, they gave four-minute speeches. Uh, they're also responsible, the Committee on Public Information is also responsible for getting and encouraging the passage of the Espionage Act, basically making it a crime to criticize the government, to criticize the war, to criticize the president. Um, any claim that Wall Street is behind this war, you know, Wall Street making sure that we get our loans back from the Allies, any claim of that was seen as sedition. Any socialist publication was forbidden. Uh, the United States Postal Service would not allow any socialist publication to pass through the mail, which obviously is a violation of uh, the Declaration of uh, our, our Bill of Rights, I should say. But at the, in a time of war, the government has taken upon itself the ability to take certain concessions for success of the war. Other acts, Sabotage and Sedition Act, uh, making again making it illegal to speak openly against the war. And here's a couple of posters. My it's actually my favorite poster. It's an English poster, but here on the left it shows uh, from the British Union. Once a German, always a German. So early, early on, the Germans were shown in a negative light. They killed the babies. They round up the husbands and kill the husbands, and then once the husbands and the men are out of the way, they take advantage of the women, make them wait on them and other things. And then when they're all said and done, they destroy the town and leave it behind. Well, looky here. Look, the same German is your banker. It's your, it's your guy that you just bought your furniture from in England. So once a German, always a German. Actually, as I look at this, this is probably a World War II poster because uh, German U-boats were used in World War II. They may have been used in World War I as well, but I think this may have been used for World War II. As far as espionage goes, uh, this, this poster could be seen probably anywhere in the United States. Don't talk. Spies are listening. The German population in the United States had a, had a pretty rough during uh, World War One. There were some German-Americans who were uh, openly opposed to the war and condemned Germany for being in the war. Then there were some Germany, Germans who were still very loyal to Germany. Uh, regardless of that, the United States citizens did not take time to figure out whose side the Germans were on. If you were German, if you had a German name, you were uh, facing some serious prejudice uh, against them. So on to the beginning of the end. Armistice is signed 1918. Armistice simply means a an agreement to cease fire. Uh, you know, we celebrate this day as Veterans Day on November 11th, 11-11-11. Um, the, uh, on the, uh, the 11th hour of the 11th day um, of the 11th month, uh, all fighting has ceased. Uh, in Germany, we see the abdication of the Kaiser. Um, the war takes a turn for the worse for Germany when the United States gets involved. Uh, the Kaiser does seek refuge within his army, but is not uh, successful there. He's finally run out. Um, I don't know that he's ever captured. I know during the Treaty of Versailles, France and England both wanted to hunt this guy down and hang him from the Eiffel Tower if they could, uh, as he was seen as the biggest cause uh, for the war being so enormous, as it were. Um, they do punish Germany extensively. Again, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in Russia being taken out of the war in 1918. Uh, that's the beginning of communism uh, in Russia. And then Wilson's 14 points plan does not get a lot of success either in Europe or the United States. Point number 14 is the creation of League of Nations. That is the one it is accepted. The United States, however, it does not participate in the League of Nations. And so it's a fairly weak league. And as, as a result, Germany is allowed to... Uh, Remilitarize and regain a lot of his territory in preparation for World War II. Uh, Wilson's plan is rejected. Wilson gets a warm welcome in Paris as he is seen 
as the leader of the United States, but also the United States is the pivotal moment uh, when they enter the war to turn the war in favor of the Allies. And so he receives a warm welcome as as far as that go. But his plan, on the other hand, is rejected <laughs> probably just as uh, emphatically uh, at the at the peace conference. Uh, again, England and France really wanted to punish Germany for this war. In the United States, the League of Nations and the treaty is not welcomed well because the United States wants to go back to this relative isolationist policy. You know, we didn't want it, a lot of Americans did not want to be involved in the war at all. We were kind of forced in because of what Germany was doing and because of the secret alliance with Mexico. But after that, they many Americans hoped that we could go back to being neutral and being isolated. But the, you know, it's it's an impossibility. Regardless, we tried because of our attempts. We do refuse to be a part of the League of Nations. We do refuse the Treaty of Versailles, which makes the treaty very weak. There is a fear now of the Bolshevik Revolution spreading to America. This uh, this Red Scare in America, the very first Red Scare. That you know, communism, since it's no longer a theory, that communism can uh, find its way into American society. We do see the Communist Party of the United States forming. Uh, the Bolsheviks and Trotsky and Lenin, they do make a public statement that we will <laughs> infiltrate your society as well. And so uh, we, that we do just go into this uh, fear of anything, fear of anything, communism. Um, Wilson again unable to gain support because he's he's unwilling to compromise with the Republicans essentially. Uh, here's some specific information about the Red Scare. Um, a lot of uh, prominent politicians receive envelopes that are supposed to uh, explode simultaneously. I think in New York City or maybe Boston, uh, a major city in the Northeast, there are several bombs that do go off simultaneously. Uh, the home of Mitchell Palmer, the Attorney General of the United States, uh, has a bomb go off in front of his house, and it destroys part of his house, and that's enough for him. He goes on this radical campaign against communists and anyone who appears to be favoring or have a sentiment toward uh, communism. And he has at his side a young man called named J. Edgar Hoover, and they carry out what will become known as the Palmer Raids across the United States, 6,000 arrests. Uh, I think just about all of them are released because they don't find anything. They expected to find bombs and guns and paraphernalia about a radical takeover. Uh, in all of the, in the of the entire campaign, they find three pistols, no dynamite. They do uh, successfully deport 500 people in the country illegally, but that's the uh, that's the extent of the Palmer Raids. But there's just this major scare of communism in the countries right after World War One. Um, I guess the Red Scare kind of comes to a head with the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti, two, two men accused of killing uh, a paymaster in uh, Massachusetts. Very low evidence against them, but because Sacco and Vanzetti have made it very public that they are anarchists, that's, that's enough. Anarchy is uh, equated with guilt, and so they are both electrocuted, despite worldwide pleas for a retrial, both those men are executed again Germany is being punished excessively for this war they didn't start the war but they made the war very very large and made the war go on as long as it it did so 33 billion is the number of war damages war reparations that they have to pay 33 billion marks uh, the German economy can't there's no way they can come up with that money, so they just start printing money. And, of course, that causes just an outrageous amount of inflation. You can see the pictures here. They print so much money that it becomes worthless. It is actually cheaper to wallpaper your house with German marks than it is to actually go out and buy wallpaper. And children are playing with bricks of German marks. Uh, there's a sign or a, a photo that I'm reminded of of a woman in an open market in Germany trying to buy a head of lettuce. And it's a, the one head of lettuce is a 1,000 marks. That's how much uh, the inflation was just simply out of control. 
because Germany had hoped to pay off their debt in this manner. The uh, crushed German economy sets the stage. The German people want someone to do something. They want someone to help them out of their condition. And a young man by the name of Adolf Hitler seems to have the answer. Anyhow, unreasonable European demands on Germany, the lack of a United States presence in the League of Nations, all of this leads directly to World War II. Again, what was supposed to be the war to end all wars did nothing more than plant the seeds for the beginning of the war. Uh, in regards to Hitler's rise, he uh, we'll probably talk about this when we get to World War II, but he's involved as a, as a small... Uh, private in the in the army, he gets involved in what's known as the Beer Hall Revolt, the plan to overthrow the current German government because they're not really doing anything, and the Jewish people in in the government in charge of the German economy are blamed for Germany's loss of the war, and so there's a big revolt in the streets, and the first time it happens, Hitler and others are rounded up and thrown in jail, and that's where he writes his book. But, uh, yeah, World War One really does nothing but uh, settle the dust, so to speak, just a little bit. But uh, it comes back with a major force in World War Two. Guys, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. See ya.